I was at the first floor, so I didn't see. So who's in DevOps here? Quick show of hands. Who's ever been on call? Yeah, it sucks, doesn't it? <laughs> Who's ever missed an alert? Like your phone was off, you left it in the car, you were in the bathroom, the kids were screaming. Doesn't matter, it, not judging or anything. You, I, I miss plenty of alerts. Like some days I even forgot I muted my phone and I realized when I got to, to miss calls at three in the morning. It happens. Now there's a bit worse. Whoever missed an outage, like you just didn't get any alert for it. And basically you come back to the office on Monday morning and it looks like that. <laughs> and people are like, what were you doing this weekend? I'm like, what were you doing this weekend? <laughs> I don't take that kind of sass from you, buddy. That's what I call user-based monitoring when people that use your product let you know that it's down because you're just not even aware of it. And, you know, I, I'm not shaming anyone. Uh, I'm personally, I'm coming from the upside of things, and I've always taken on call very seriously, right? It's actually, I just asked you all of them, it's actually 30 minutes about cats. 30 minute talk, just cats. <laughs> you can't leave, close the doors, close the doors, quick. <laughs> but yeah, uh, we all take off very, very seriously, right? Um, uh, here you go. I'm not pointing fingers. The real question is, why are we even on call to begin with? I mean, personally, I hate being woken up in the middle of the night. I'm not a masochist either. I think it's a terrible system, but we do it anyway. And you know why? Whoop, come on. Because we have users. We fight for the users. We are on call because people somewhere use our services. And at this point, it doesn't even matter if you sell something for money, whether it's a product or a service or an object or something, like whether you're Amazon or not for profit. Outage has consequence. If you're selling product or services, if you have guaranteed SLAs, you owe people money or you lose money every time it goes down. And even more so, like here in New Zealand, I'm in Australia myself, but in New Zealand, it's the same thing. When people are like, it's okay if it's down in the middle of the night, who cares? Well, if you have users in the States or in Europe, I can tell you that in the middle of the night, they care a lot. <laughs> and similarly, like if someone says, hey, it's okay if it's down at like two in the morning, Pacific time, I'm like, that's great. That's like the middle of the day for me. So good on you, buddy. Australia exists. Thank you. It, it, it's that thing at the bottom, you know, like over there, like right next to New Zealand, <laughs> right, right next to the Hobbit, okay? <laughs> and, and sometimes it's even more critical, like recently in Australia, Telstra, which is the national phone provider, was down for something like eight hours, people could not call triple zero. Can you imagine the actual cost of that? There's no price, there's a cost, the cost of human lives. Imagine you're responsible for a suicide hotline and you go down in the middle of the night. People don't feel depressed in the middle of the day. They feel depressed in the middle of the night. There's an actual human cost to outages. That's why we need to care for our users. That's why generally we're on call. The question is then, why are we not getting alerts? Why are we not being aware of outages? Well, sometimes we just don't know. We, we just don't measure the right thing. It's like, looks green to me. Uh, you sure? Yeah, yeah, it's green to me. And you open the browser like, okay, maybe more like orangey, reddish green. But, you know, I mean, maybe you're colorblind. You know, green is red. Something. Sometimes they're just too much red. I, I had a job in the past. There was two flat screens, you know, with like a dashboard, and the dashboard was always orange and red. I cared for roughly two to three weeks. After that, I stopped giving a shit. <laughs> Pardon my French. <laughs> <laughs> because it's true. I mean, when everything's critical, nothing is. Like, you just don't care anymore. You're like, that light just always goes off. And sometimes, well, you just don't even understand your system. 
I'm sure you've already seen that from the IT crowd, which is like the blinking light. What does it do? I don't know. Is it supposed to do that? Maybe. <laughs> so we can all agree your users are not happy. Even sometimes your internal stakeholders are not happy because they're losing money or emerging customers or anything, you know? What's going on there? What do you do? First step, you accept that everything's broken. No, this is not fine. What are we doing? Why are we sitting in the middle of a trash fire and not doing anything about it? OK, so that's broken. We are all agreeing on that. OK, that's it. <laughs> or do you fix it? Because that's nice to see. OK, so you accept it. It's broken and all, but still not fixed. It's still a trash fire. You, know, you don't even have a fire extinguisher at hand. You didn't even know where to get one, to be honest. So you just called triple zero, but tells us down. So hey, fireman's not coming anyway. Well, you know, you, you probably have someone in your team that does everything with regular expression. You know that, or you know that person that's like, oh, I know exactly the right library for it. Stop. Take this keyboard away, okay? Tap the keyboard away. Sit down and try to think about exactly what you're trying to achieve. Like, do you have too many alerts? Do you have not enough? Do you measure the right things? Do you have the right relationship with your stakeholders? Well, if you don't know that, you can code as much as you want. You're just going to have, you know, you had two problems, now you have 50. Because on top of that, you have to maintain the broken code to fix your alerts, which is uh, not great. So what's the first step for that? Well. You know, you just go at it alone, you fix it without talking to anyone. You're hailed as a hero, thank you for coming for my TED Talk. No, it's DevOps days, of course you collaborate. You ask for help, a little help goes a long way. Sometimes you have the feeling you keep sliding backward. You just need someone to give you a hand. I mean, that's literally how that works, right? You have strengths, like sysadmin people are very good at figuring out what works in production. Dev developers are very good at developing things. Performance engineers will tell you why exactly it's crashing every second Tuesday of the month. So to take, for instance, a video game analogy, you build on each other's strengths to overcompensate for your weakness. DPS world, for instance, have a high damage output, but they are a bit squishy. Healers can heal. That's literally their job. But similarly, they're squishy. A tank can take a lot of damage, but that's pretty much it. You combine all of those together, you have a team that can pretty much clear any kind of content. And I can, I can see right there that everyone looks super bored and video games not your stuff. You can try sports. <laughs> <laughs> like, imagine this kind of football, sorry, soccer team, football team, I'm not sure which one we, we use in New Zealand. They wouldn't score a lot, and it's not even guaranteed they would be super good at defense. That's not working. And I can tell soccer is not your thing either. That thing wouldn't quite get you very far in the Five Nations tourney, all right? I, I actually try to make it color correct. I'm not sure if it's the right one. <laughs> so obviously, teamwork is the key there. So you know with who you're going to fix it, but you still don't know what to fix, right? First, you need to understand the concept of actionable alert. Um, Alice Goldfuss in Monitor about 2017 ex explained the concept of actionable alerts, which is basically four points. Something's actually broken. The customers notice, or users, or internal stakeholders, anyone that basically used the product. You're the best person to fix it, and you need to fix it immediately. If none of those apply, or even oftenly three of those apply out of four, you should not get woken up. Repeat after me. You should not get woken up. What's the point of getting you out of bed if you can't fix it, or if no one notices, or if it's not even broken? Doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to quickly go over the legs four points. So for starters, what's broken? Let's say your test, the straight line, is if everything goes over five milliseconds, it's broken. And the other graph is what's actually measured over the day. 
it's like, okay, so I'm getting at least two alerts every day for absolutely no reason, because I don't know what's my baseline. That's great, so what's my baseline? Or do I know what's the baseline? Well, I'm sure there's someone in your company whose exact job is to measure performance, to measure baseline, to see what's normal and what's not. Try to talk to Q&A or performance engineers. They know that thing. They actually live to break it. So they can exactly tell you, OK, so that thing right now, you're losing memory super fast. Like, it's been running for 24 hours. It's already using too much memory. There's some kind of memory leak in your code. You should fix it now. If you catch it early enough, even before it hits production, you will never get woken up by it. To me, that's a win. The second point is customer noticed. What's actually a problem right now? If a server crashes in the middle of a forest and no one's actually using it, <laughs> is it actually down? <laughs> it, it's true. I mean, personally, I, don't, I did some very disgusting thing in my career which I'm not proud of, but I will share with you because it's going to stay between us, right? <laughs> right? We had a service that would just start crashing randomly in the middle of the night, and of course, people would call up first thing in the morning when they get to the office, and like, hey, so the directory server's down again, and, and so you have to rush, and you have to quickly, tell, and people just, you know, twiddle their thumbs for an hour until you get there, because of course, if your directory service is not working, nothing works at the company. And like, so do you have a people working like overnight or if it's like pff, now earliest is like eight in the morning. So we just set up a bash script that restart the server every day at six and send us an alert if it's not coming back up by seven. That way, 7.55, we're there to restart it if we need. Never got any complaint after it. It's disgusting, but that's the thing. Do you really need to be woken up at three or four in the morning when it crashes, knowing no one's going to notice before eight? You have to be smart about it, basically. The other thing is, are you even aware that things are broken? Like, do you talk to your users in person? You know who talks to your users? Support, sales, pre-sales? Like, is there even pathways in your company for raising issues like that? Like, do you have a list of common gripes, for instance, from your customers? Do you have any feedback from sales calls where they're like, oh, sorry, we lost a deal because X and Y. Do you have access to like sales reports or most commonly requested features? Because what you call a feature, some people call a bug or a broken workflow, and for them, it's just as good as an outage. They can't do their job, obviously it's broken. You need to basically talk to just more than devs, which is coming up soon. No jokes, I mean, it's easy, DevOps. But for instance, support, support here all day long about everything that's broken. If they cannot communicate with ops or devs about it, you will never be aware of it until it's too late. Like if some people say, hey, we have an elevated rate of 500, and they're like, cool story. But if they have a mechanism to raise that immediately with production, it's, it's the difference between 1% service degradation and 100% outage because you're like, hey, I have a flaky server in my farm. I should probably get on that right now. The next step is, are you the best person to fix it? Modern web application allegory, there's a queuing system in there, key value store, one or two database. There's a front end, there's a back end. Front end is in Ruby, back end is in JavaScript, because why not? <laughs> you don't even understand how any of that work. And yet, you get woken up at 3 in the morning to fix it? Yeah, ziff. <laughs> the dev probably does, though. And if you're only paging them when it's broken, not only are they going to be cranky, but they're not going to help you fix it. Because they're like, could have asked me, like, when it was daylight, for starters. And you know, sometimes it's not even your fault. Like, whoever committed that just left. Turned out they were not very good at their job. Yeah, well, we knew. Sometimes it's even better, you have buy-in straight from the top, and you're like, from the beginning, you walk side by side, you actually talk to each other, you put reasonable features in the code, like tracing, like logging, alerting, the devs tell you exactly from the beginning 
What is it supposed to look like so you can clearly, with the help of Q&A, have your baseline straight away before you even take it to poll? That's great. I love it, personally. And the fourth point, as I said, is that even an outage. Like, do you need to be alerted when a replica goes down? Well, what's the point of redundancy, really? If you get alerted on every tiny little mistake, it's not going to work. Uh, can you support it? Is there any regressions? Is there any performance issue you're aware of? Well, again, is that an outage? That's the thing, really. It's like we tend to be to go overboard with that. Basically, we're like, oh, I don't want to miss an alert, so I'm just going to alert on everything. Yeah, that's not any really of that work. Imagine if a standard car would have a light on the dashboard for every of those parts. You would never drive. You would just have a giant Christmas tree <laughs> with a steering wheel in front of it. Right now, you have like a couple of lights, engine lights and all lights. So you're like, OK. The engine lights on, something's wrong in the engine. You don't know what, but does it really matter? It just tells you, hey, that's probably not super safe to drive. You should take it to a mechanic. Instead of telling you, OK, so it could be one of the six different things. It could be the spark plug, or it could be the oil, or it could be the tire pressure. I'm not sure which, just, you know, I'm going to light all six just to be safe. Yeah, that's definitely not helpful. All you need to know is, is it up or is it down? You also need to, mind you, that's the next point. How do you define what's up and what's down? Well, if you already know the ending, if you already know the story ends, that's a lot easier. That's the thing. What's up and what's down? Well, let's say, for instance, you're having a marketplace product. What's up? Well, you can log in or create an account, put something in your cart, check out, log out, access your settings. That's up. At this point, I don't care if your super redundant MySQL cluster is up or down, or if one of the replica is flaky or anything. I don't care. I mean, good for you. It's great. I mean, you can talk to it, you know, around a glass or something. It's, love it. All I care is, can I actually purchase something from you? And if I can't, then that's broken. So you can basically rewrite all your tests as you would do, for instance, for developers, you would do integration tests. It, unit tests are great, but you know, we've all seen that picture with the two windows where each of one separately can open, but both of them together are blocked. That's pretty much what we do in monitoring every day. Oh, well, I have all those thousands of tiny little tests together. OK, but is it up or down? I don't know. So a good example for that is yeah, a simple script that basically try to log on your website and then log out. If that's not working, then you can add context around that, right? You can be like, OK, so I cannot log on. So there's probably either something wrong with the front page or with the SSO or the authentication system or the directory services. And then you can just you know, go down the decision tree and decide, all right, so basically it's that single flaky server. But you don't need to alert on every single server in that chain. What's the point? Like, you have redundancy for a good reason. And sometimes you don't even need those servers, and you completely forgot they exist. So, you know, back to the single server in the forest. The other part is obviously, because let's be honest, if you start fixing your alerts, you're not going to have less alerts. You're going to have more, a lot more, because you're being in that weird system, weird state, where your old alerts are still somewhat doing their job, so you can't completely delete them. But you have the new ones getting rolled up, which also do their own thing. And now you're like, why oh, is that fixing my problem? I just get pitched more. That's not how any of that was supposed to work. Well, similarly, you know, Back to what you were doing with support, what you were doing with QA, back to what you were doing with devs, you can do things like A-B testing in production, like let's try to turn off this alert for an hour every day while the new system is on and see and monitor manually and check, hey, am I missing anything? No? All right, let's continue like that. 
you can try chaos engineering and just break things on purpose and see what gets picked up. That's another thing. Obviously, try to break staging on purpose first to be safe. You will have to log recurring issues like uh, the previous speaker said. If you don't even know what you're spending your time on, or do you know what to fix first? If you have the same service falling over and over and over again, well, maybe you should fix that one first, obviously. You have to analyze basically what's an actual pain point in your company, what's keeping you up at night. Uh, and sometimes you have to really dig at it until you figure it out completely. Uh, I remember some really weird edge case where everything on paper and in alerting was fine, everything was green, logging was all well and done, and people were actually start using the product and it wouldn't work. And we tried to trace it, we couldn't reproduce it or anything, and then we asked them exactly, okay, so what are you using? Like, I actually jumped on a call with the customers to figure out what was going on, and it turned out that the particular certificate they used was from a known third party, but whose certificate was not in Firefox. So Firefox was like, oh, it's taking me a while to verify. Let me spend 10 seconds, and then I'm going to time out on that, because I can't find a CA for it. I'm like, yay. Good thing that Curl picked that one out. That's the thing. You, you have to know what you're fixing. Basically, you can't just be like, I'm going to fix everything. Yeah, OK, so what's everything? Well, you know. The broken things. Yeah, which one? Um, the database? <laughs> we don't use database. We only have a key value store. Yeah, that, the key value store database. That's not how any of that works. So, shh, shh, shh. And, and understand it because we already stretch, you know, like when you're fighting fires, you don't really have time to sit down and you just have so many things to do and just not enough time. And you're like, but I'm already asking for help and I have to organize QA and support and sales and, and, and when am I actually going to fix it? Well, if your company is large enough or have a specific development outlet, it's very likely they have people that manage projects for a living or gather requ requirements for a living, you know, like business analysts, project managers, you know, the people we like to make fun of even because we don't quite understand what they do. And we are like, I can use Excel too, that should be super easy. <laughs> it's like, you know, when people see you typing on terminal, it's like, I can do that too. Uh, do you know what I'm doing? Well, you just type random keys, right? That's it, I mean, I mean the matrix. That's. As for their help, you know, they're really, really good at taking a massively large project that's going to spawn several months, that's going to need to incorporate tens of people and break into tiny, manageable chunks. You can do maybe one or two hours a day, or even on half days. And the second part is you need to stop that. No one likes meetings. I get it. No one likes to be interrupted. You think you're the only one who needs focus? Try interrupting a sales call for shit and giggles. You're going to love it. I think you're never going to see someone get so red so fast. People actually need focus. Everyone needs focus. And the best way to not be interrupted is to gather everyone at the same time, in the same place, at a given time, so people can prepare themselves for it and then not be interrupted for the rest of the week. I know, it's really, really hard. You have to talk to people. You have to give before you take. Because if you just barge in, be like, why no one talked to me like two months ago when the project started? I'm like, well, yeah, we tried. And you said, not now, you're busy. And then I sent you two calendars invite. And you're like, oh, I fucking hate meetings. <laughs> meetings such a waste. I was in the, in the zone. I'm like, well, that's great. You know, the zone's still there. You'll get back to it. And honestly, if your work is so complex that any interruption will break it, it's probably a good sign you should break it down a bit. <laughs> like maybe you write things down, use paper and pen. That's very good implement. It's very low tech, but it works. But, or even, you know, whiteboard. Whiteboards are awesome. You know, it makes you look very smart with all of diagrams and stuff. 
It prepares you for interviews for your next job as well, you know. <laughs> Don't be afraid of the whiteboard. But yeah, basically, if you need help, and if you want help, you have to give. You have to become that person where people not only are not afraid to come to you, but they actually welcome your presence in the room. That way, you get paged in very early in the development process. You can identify problems. If anyone has any issues, they can come to you when it's still an X problem and not a Y problem, which is you know, the basic conundrum, which is, how oh, do I do Y? Well, that's a bit weird. Like that's a, what are you working on? Oh, actually, I want to solve X. Oh, X is easy. I can solve X. Why do you ask about Y? Well, because I thought if I did that, I could do that thing. Yeah, no, that's not how that works. Just, just ask the real question. And the last step of this organization is money. <laughs> not everything is a price, everything is a cost. I know it's got really, really dark with the suicide outline thing, but how much would you put on a human life? That's the whole extreme. Like, basically, that should be your, the top of your ruler. It's like, on the, on the scale of one to a human life, how much is it costing? I told you, it's going, to, it's going to get dark really, really quick. But I think, if you just go and complain that you keep being woken up and all, and like people are like, well, tough shit, I have a kid, all right? <laughs> I haven't had a single night of sleep for the last nine months. And you're telling me about what a pain it is to be woken up in the middle of the night. No one cares. But if you say, OK, so basically every hour worked overnight is double pay, and they have to come in two hours later in the morning, and their work doesn't work, and we spend that much time fighting fires, and we lost that much sales, and all. Give concrete numbers, which you know is going to be easy because you're already having reports about everything that's broken, or at least easy ish. And once you can actually put a cost on this, you can be like, Right, so we lost X thousands, X hundreds of thousands, X millions of dollars because our alerting is not working. And you can even go so far as requesting code freezes. Why not? I mean, if it's broken, why not just put a stop, fix it, make it all flat, and then no more alerts. Obviously, it's not always working because your competitors don't do code freeze. They always push new features. They're like, oh, you care about stability. That's cute. We care about stealing your customers. <laughs> Yay! But you can do things. It, once, you go, like, once you involve, for instance, your business analyst or project manager, you can actually break it into chunks. And instead of having, let's say, 10% time or hack days, why don't you have technical dead Fridays, where you just pick up that bug, the one you hate, the one you saw first day you started, and like, when I have time, I'm going to fix you. Well, you know what? This Friday, you got the time. That's your Friday. You can fix that bug if you want. No one's going to interrupt you. No one's going to tell you off for fixing it. Go nuts. And why can you do that? Because you told them, hey, if I spend eight hours fixing that, it's going to save us half a million over the next five years. People are like, wow, that's cheap. That's really cheap. We don't even pay you that in 10 years. Nice. And in conclusion, basically, the whole is greater than the sums. We are all so busy working, you know, head down, trying to do our things, we completely forgot to talk to each other. By combining all our powers, we can be like the super Voltron of user support, you know, like really getting that out and making it 100% of time. Thank you so much.